Hi, I'm Nancy Cavey, National ERISA and IDI Disability Attorney. Welcome to Winning Isn't Easy. Before we get started, I have to give you a legal disclaimer required by the Florida Bar. So I'm going to tell you that this podcast isn't legal advice. So now that I've said it, there's nothing that prevents me from giving you an easy to understand overview of the disability insurance world, the games that carriers play, and what you need to know to get the disability benefits you deserve. So off we go. In this special episode, the breast cancer edition, I'm going to be talking about the five-step evaluation process used by disability insurance carriers in every breast cancer claim. The myths that disability insurance policyholders believe about breast cancer disability claims and the truth. And the five tips to winning your breast cancer disability insurance claim. We're going to take a brief break, but when we come back, we'll begin. Stay tuned. Welcome back. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This is an annual campaign to increase awareness, raise money for breast cancer research, and help support women and men in need. Breast cancer is a disease in which the malignant cells form in the tissues of the breast. One in eight women in the U.S. will develop breast cancer in their lifetime, and one in 1,000 men will get breast cancer. You may have purchased a disability insurance policy through your employer or on your own to provide you and your family with peace of mind if you became disabled. Unfortunately, disability carriers don't make it easy for those with breast cancer or those who have complications from the treatment to get the disability benefits they deserve. So let's talk about that five-step evaluation process used by disability carriers in every breast cancer claim. You may have been diagnosed with breast cancer. You may be struggling to keep working or having side effects of treatment. Before you stop work or file a claim for short or long-term disability benefits, I think you need to understand the evaluation process used by disability carriers in determining whether they're going to pay you or not. At step one, the issue is simply, is there objective medical evidence that's the basis for the breast cancer diagnosis? Many disability policies will require objective medical evidence of diagnosis, which is generally not a problem in breast cancer cases. However, it's the complications of treatment, such as lymphedemia, tingling and numbness of the extremities, bowel or bladder problems, fatigue or chemo fog, that can be difficult to prove without testing. Now, your medical record should document not only the physical examination findings, laboratory findings, and diagnostic studies that confirm the existence and severity of your symptoms, but it's crucial that you're giving your doctor an accurate history. That history should be a history of your symptoms, and you want to be explaining to your doctor how your symptoms impact your ability to perform activities of daily living. So, for example, if you suffer from lymphedemia of your upper arm, you might have to wear a sleeve to control the swelling, and you might have difficulty as a result picking up a pot uh, to put it on the stove or to reach into your pantry to get something off the shelf. So we want to have a history of your symptoms and your functionality. The carrier is going to get your medical records and they're going to make sure that the history of your symptoms and the examination findings are consistent not only with your symptoms but are consistent with the known complications of treatment. The second thing they're going to do is to ask whether there's objective medical evidence that's the basis of the restrictions and limitations that have been assigned by your physician. Look, I know that treatment for breast cancer can cause pain, fatigue, tingling and numbness in your hands or feet, depression, mood swings, and even memory loss. The combination of these kinds of side effects as a result of treatment can prevent you from doing even what's called sedentary work, and that's defined basically as work where you're sitting six out of eight hours a day and lifting no more than 10 pounds a day. In the process of uh, filing a claim, the insurance company is going to ask your doctor to fill out some forms. They're called attending physician statement forms or APS forms. Those forms are going to ask questions about your restrictions and limitations. 
But unfortunately, there isn't a uniform APS form that's used across the United States. And worse yet, I find that carriers APS forms are designed to have your physician say that you can do at least sedentary work, particularly if you're in the uh, any occupation stage. Well, why would they do that? Well, the reality is they don't want to pay your benefits. But if the doctor is um, concluding uh, that you can do sedentary work, you may not be disabled under the terms of the policy. The APS form is also going to ask your doctor to explain the objective medical evidence that supports your restrictions and limitations. Now, that can be tough because not all the symptoms like fatigue, pain, or chemo brain, brain rather, can be substantiated on an objective basis. I think that one way to help your physician complete an APS form is for you to give the doctor a really good interval history between visits about what your symptoms were and how your symptoms impair your ability to function. Now, we've created a form that we call symptoms and functionality that we ask our clients to complete uh, and give to their doctor at each visit and ask the doctor to make that part of uh, their chart. Of course, I want to review it first before uh, they give it to their doctor because I want to make sure that it accurately and completely explains uh, my client's symptoms and how it impacts my client's ability to function. At step three or question three, there's an issue of whether there's a causal relationship between the breast cancer diagnosis and the assigned restrictions and limitations and your inability to do your own or any occupation. Now, as we've talked about before, normally the uh, disability is defined as an inability to do your own occupation, uh, to do the material and substantial duties of your own occupation. And after a period of time, normally like two years, the definition is going to change to an inability to do any occupation by virtue of your education, training, and experience. And so, uh, what's important, obviously, is a causal relationship between your diagnosis and your restrictions and your uh, inability to do either your own or any occupation, depending on where you're at in your claim. Now, the key to getting your disability benefits is that APS form that will explain your functional capacity in detail. Um, now, what's important about this is that you need to understand that the form purposely does not ask the right questions. And the way the questions are framed it are to lead your doctor to a conclusion that you can engage in some form of work. And particularly if you're in the own, I'm sorry, any occupation stage, uh, your ability to do sedentary work. So take a look at that APS form and you'll see that it just doesn't at, ask the right questions. Now, I like to modify that form with the Social Security Breast Cancer Residual Functional Capacity form that I use and most Social Security lawyers will use in their Social Security cases. Now, why would you want to do that? Because, pretty simply, in my view, the RFC form, that Social Security Breast Cancer Residual Functional Capacity form, really asks the right questions about your breast cancer and complications. And so I like to make that uh, as an addendum to the carrier's attending physician statement form. And if you're applying for Social Security, of course, your lawyer can be using uh, not only the APS forms, but the residual functional capacity form in your Social Security case. Once the carrier gets these forms, they're going to have their medical unit review your file to determine whether you have the restrictions and limitations assigned by your doctor and your real, in quotes, restrictions and limitations. Now, they generally don't accept what your physician has to say, particularly if you are in the uh, any occupation stage. The disability carrier is going to have a hired medical gun who's going to look at your records, look at the APS form and say, look, there's no objective basis for the restrictions and limitations assigned by your physician. And they're going to do that to set this case up for a claims denial. Worse yet is they might even have an independent medical evaluation. And if you're scheduled for one, you definitely need to call an experienced disability attorney like myself or someone else because the independent medical examination is not independent. Once the carrier has gotten a medical review of your APS forms and medical records, the carrier is going to send your file to their vocational rehabilitation counselor, a VE. And the job of the VE is to, deter is to determine what your occupation was at the time you became disabled, the physical duties of your occupation, 
and whether or not you can perform those occupational duties based on whatever the restrictions and limitations that the carrier thinks applies. So let's ask ourselves, what is your occupation? We've got to get that policy out because your policy may provide that the carrier can determine your occupation based on something called the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, which is a book that's probably about 50 years old now, hasn't been updated in 50 years, and rarely accurately describes occupational duties as they're, how, as they're really performed today. Now, the definition of disability may not be how you performed it for your employer, or it may not be how it's performed in the local economy. All of those definitions can be problematic because in my view, the real issue is can you do your own occupation as performed? But that's not what the disability policy may say. So once we get past the hurdle of what is the definition of occupation in your policy, you've got to be aware that the carrier's VE often will get an occupation wrong. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but what they're looking for in misclassifying your occupation is a way to say that the occupation they've identified you as being capable of doing is one that's pretty easy for them to slot into a sedentary type position. And that makes it easier for them to deny your claim. Now, as I said, many policies provide that after a certain period of time, the standard of disability will change from an inability to do your own occupation to an inability to do any occupation. The disability carrier is going to reevaluate your restrictions and limitations and determine if there's any other occupation you can perform that pays similar wages. This is not a real world test. And often the carrier will determine purposely that you can do a sedentary job just to deny benefits. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to continue to discuss the evaluation process that um, disability carriers will use in evaluating your breast cancer claim. Have you been robbed of your peace of mind from your disability insurance carrier? You owe it to yourself to get a copy of Robbed of Your Peace of Mind, which provides you with everything you need to know about the long-term disability claim process. Request your free copy of the book at kvlaw.com today. <laughs> 